All right, welcome back. Episode 147 of Chaotically Intolerant. Um, we have a big episode today. Max Chadwick from Pro Football Focus is joining the show. Big deal. Um, if you're brand new here, I'm not always the smartest one. You know, I, I, I know the YouTube comments love to uh, love to tear me apart at times. We've gotten some things wrong, but I'm, I'm going to get them wrong again. That, that's just how it is. Um, but we had a great interview with him. We do a draft of number one picks. Um, you can go vote on that at chaoticallyintolerant.com right now. And um, just make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Go follow Max. Uh, check out Draft America for Michael's stuff. Um, and let's let's jump into it. All right. We're here with Max, Max Chadwick. I already butchered the introduction at the very, very beginning. But that's what the show's about. Um, thank you for coming on, Max. This is awesome. You were at the Combine. Shoot, time flies. How long ago was it now? A couple weeks? A week ago? Uh, a couple weeks, yeah. It felt like a couple days ago, honestly. But yeah, it's been a couple weeks now. So I, I want to ask, like, what's it like? Like, what, what's what's going on? Like, just because the combine feels like such a weird place at times. It's like these guys are just running drills. You got coaches on. Like, who's there? What's it like being at the combine? Dude, it is. I, I say this all the time. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year and also one of my least favorite weeks of the year because it's so cool uh, running into all these people that you look up to and a lot of the media people that I, I've always, you know, I love reading their stuff, watching their stuff, and you get to meet them in person. That's awesome. Uh, the only problem is that it is an all day thing. And it's like a, it's like a week long bender, honestly, man. So we, uh, we stayed there for five days in an Airbnb. Um, you're on your feet all the time. So like at the end of it, I had blisters all up my feet. My legs were killing me. Um, and basically you get up super early in the morning around like six, 7 AM, probably go to the convention center, spend all day there. And then you're going out at night too. Um, and going out drinking uh with uh with some great awesome people but you're out until 3 a.m and you're doing that five days in a row going to bed at three waking up at seven and it's just like it is awful uh so at the end of it you know we were all absolutely exhausted at the end of it it was an absolutely it was a great time though super cool to uh to brush shoulders with a lot of really cool people i actually uh, luckily enough this is um the, kind of the first year where i got to see a lot of the guys i interviewed um on my show called preferred Wa or now pms college football show uh, and that was really cool. I actually, one of them, you know, saw me, he said, F yeah, at his podiums. So I thought it was super cool. So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely really cool to, to see all the players there, see all the coaches there, um, and see all the media people that have uh, really been huge names, honestly. And it, it's a super cool experience. I highly recommend it. Just, uh, be sure to, to pack uh, comfortable sneakers though, cause you're going to need it. <laughs> so Indy lives up to the hype because you always hear good things about Indy, but it definitely lives up to the hype. Yes. Yeah. Indy lives up to the hype. I, I think it's fantastic. Honestly, I, I'd be pretty upset if they move the combine. I know they've been talking about moving the combine to another city uh, in the near future, kind of like spreading out, like how the NFL draft has always been in New York and then they kind of spread it out now. Um, I, I think they're going to try to do that at the combine. I would hate that. I think it's a perfect setup with what they got in the convention center right by Lucas Oil Stadium if you want to go see the drills. Um, which I didn't get to do this year. But uh, then also, like, right around the convention center is all these great restaurants, all these great bars. Our Airbnb is literally right there, too. So it, it's a perfect setup, honestly. And I think if you go to another city where you have to Uber more, that could be a, a hassle. So I, I love Indianapolis, honestly. And I, I think it's the perfect place for the combine. I've been to Indy once. I'm a Colts fan. I went. Um, it was the Carson Wentz year where the Colts played the Patriots on Saturday Night Football. Mm -hmm. Awesome atmosphere. The people are awesome there. So because I live in Florida, I've only seen Colts games away. So it was really cool to see Lucas Oil. Um, but I want to get like, how did you get started in this? Like, where do people start basically for something like this? This isn't a traditional job, I guess. No, it's not. Uh, I, I have to remind myself that all the time. Whereas wherever I complain about it, I'm like, you know, listen, man, I, I, it is also a, a super cool job that I'm able to work. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, I, I kind of learned pretty early on in my life that I wasn't athletic enough to play in the NFL. Um, <laughs> and I also learned pretty early on that I love the NFL. I love more so college football, which is what I cover now, college football. Um, and, at, you know, I kind of knew this should be a career path for me where when I was like a kid, I was like probably eight years old or so at the dinner table. And I would talk about football so much that my mom actually put like a hard cap on, uh, like, I think the first five minutes of dinner, I could talk about football. After that, you can't talk about it anymore. So I knew <laughs> if it was at that point where I wanted to talk about it that much, I should probably make it a career. Um, so I went into high school, did newspaper writing, uh, broadcasting in high school, Went to Syracuse, uh, which is some consider you know, the best in this country for sports broadcasting. Did that for four years. Uh, got an internship with PFF 
uh, and social media, which actually I still work social media for them. It's kind of actually my full-time job. And then I, I was, I kind of lucked into them needing a college football analyst and I love college football and I've, I had the experience to about writing and broadcasting before. So kind of just took that and ran with it uh, over the last year or so. So that, that's kind of been a dream come true for me. And yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm, this is my favorite company. I loved as a kid was PFF and for me to be doing kind of my dream job for them too right now is, uh, is definitely really cool. And, I, and I'm super, super grateful for that. College football or NFL, like your opinion, which one is your favorite? It's not even close, dude, college football. It's not even close. Come not, on. Not, not even Don't freaking close. Yeah, yeah. It's not even close, dude. NFL, listen, I love the NFL. I still love the NFL. And we, uh, we're we going crazy today on social media with just putting yeah. out all these graphics of all these free agent signings. And I think it's great. But college football, there's something about it, man, that is just – you just feel the energy more than the NFL. Um, and I love it. And it's just like these kids out there that are just killing it. Now it is becoming more – um, kind of like a semi-pro, which I don't love that a little bit. But, of course, I love the kids getting paid. But I, I do think college football – I actually have a shirt in my closet that says literally college football greater than NFL. I, I, I don't think it's close. I think college football is, uh, is the best sport in, uh, in the world right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an NFL guy. I just – watching – seeing half the games being like 60 to 7 on like a regular Saturday is like, oh, that's my fair. God. Yeah, but fair. the obviously the greatest college football game will top – the greatest yeah. NFL game, but on average, and I know Mike, you're a you're more of a co- or an NFL well, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's also just the amount of teams, right? There's so many college teams, and you have 32 NFL teams. That's all you got to focus on the 32 teams. So, but it's football. It's amazing either way. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess Mike, did you have any questions for him? I've been talking. No, I, but I I told you that he was going to say definitely college more and i know max like you and i were talking about this before like there's something too about it being kind of the it's the beginning you know the whole journey i mean obviously their journey start much younger they start peewee and then high you know middle school high school but there's that that i don't know i guess it feels more pure right like that's just that's because a lot of these guys they don't get the opportunity then to go play in the nfl but they all have story to tell and they all have kind of a a interesting way that they got there yeah i think that's a great point you know and i think I don't want to say the NFL is too corporate, but there's a lot of times where the NFL does feel like that. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I've had the very fortunate opportunity to interview a lot of great college players before they go to the NFL. And you could tell, like, you know, when you interview NFL players, they're very media trained. Like if you interview college kids, they tell you how it is, honestly, which I think is great. Um, but, yeah, there is you know, a purity about college football that, of course, is starting to lose a little bit with, with everything going on. Um, but I still think college football is in a great state right now. I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. Um, it is a lot different than the NFL in a lot of ways. It is more chaotic than the NFL uh, in a lot of ways. You know, So that's, that's another thing why I love it so much. They don't really know what to expect a lot of times. With the NFL, you kind of you know have an inkling of what might happen. Uh, college football, these, these kids are – it's way more chaotic. So I, I think that's another great part about it too. And also I, I just think the fans have more of an allegiance to the college football teams than they do the NFL team because a lot of the fans, I mean, they went to that college. So they have, you know, obviously a, um, an obligation to, to root for that team. NFL-wise, you know, you just say, oh, you know, that's my favorite team growing up. So it's a little bit different in that too. And, and I just – I think the energy around college football was what attracts me to it so much is that there's a little bit, you know, more of an energy and more of a pop of college football than I think there is with the NFL. Yeah. Um, what about other sports? You into any other sports or is it just football? No, dude, I love, uh, I love a lot of sports. I love, obviously I love basketball. Um, I love the, I love college basketball. Obviously I'm a big college guy for a lot of things, but, uh, NBA, um, that's really the two big ones. I, I, I do watch a little baseball. I watch a little hockey. I try to keep up on those, watch a little soccer, especially when the world cup's going on. Um, but yeah, really, I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, even the off season in football, there's no off season at this point. I mean, it, it is nonstop. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of happy to be thinking about football year round and, and watching the other ones when I have a chance to. Uh, but yeah, even though we're, you know, just starting the off season, it's still, you know, I'm doing a lot of draft content right now. We're doing free agency content too. It's just, it's never, it's never ending. And the NFL, I think that's why the NFL is doing so well financially is that it kind of has a stranglehold over America that it is 12 months nonstop of NFL, even though they're in quote unquote, the off season. There really is no offseason in the end. Yeah, and can I tout the fact that you uh, predicted Michigan to win it all before the year? Cause Please do, man. That. And, <laughs> and we were talking about this because we I picked the Chiefs to beat the Niners in the Super Bowl in the preseason, and you picked Michigan to win the whole thing. So, 
I appreciate that, man. Yes. Yeah, I uh, I had I actually I went on the uh, Paul Feinbaum show um, before the season, and he asked me like, "Oh, you think so? You think Georgia's going to win it all, right?" And I was like, "Ah, Paul, actually, I think uh, I think Michigan's going to do it this year." And Paul's obviously he, you know the show's on SEC Network, so he's got a very SEC heavy fan base. Uh, the amount of Twitter mentions I got from Georgia people very upset at me for making that <laughs> prediction. Uh, it was it was insane. I had to I had to mute my Twitter for a little bit, but uh, yeah, it ended up working out. I, I knew Michigan had an unbelievable team going in, uh, and they even exceeded my expectations. Honestly, they were dominant all year long. Uh, so yeah, I, I, that was a a pretty cool feeling to to predict the uh, national champion the entire year before. It's not even like I picked the you know the the favorite either. I think Georgia was the favorite. I even think there I think there were five teams that had a better odds to win it all than Michigan entering into the year. Uh, so, wow. you know, picking Michigan, I was, I was pretty happy about that, and I'm, I'm happy it worked out. And we'll see if I can do it again this year. I have an inkling of who I think I might pick right now, <laughs> but uh, we'll see what happens uh, when we get to August when I have to make that prediction. Towson University, baby. <laughs> doing it all. Yep. See, at least you have a good – it helps when you have a good Twitter following, and your prediction coming through carries a lot more weight. You know, Besides, Chiefs Niners felt like the most obvious thing. No, that's dude. Super Bowl, Super Bowl. You got both teams know, in the Super right? Bowl, man. That's that's pretty hard. I predicted. I mean, I don't like to say this. I don't like to say this. Predicted uh, you at all? They went seven and five that year. So uh, yeah, predicting a Super Bowl, man. That is is a difficult thing. I've seen some awful Super Bowl predictions before. And I've had uh, some so the fact you got ones, both so, yeah. teams in it was, is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and I had the Lions in the NFC Championship game, but I had the Jets on the AFC side. So it's not. It's never a. It's never a straight line how you get there. So the UFL, the you know, it's. The new, the new one that's supposed to take over the NFL. Um, is that really gaining traction among, I guess, the bigger NFL people? Because it's getting a little traction among the fans. But I'm curious as how they view it. Because they could just use it as like, oh, I'm going to pick this guy, pick this guy. But they don't really think it's anything. No, I don't think I don't think the NFL is in any danger of being overtaken by any football league. Uh, at least I don't think it'll ever happen in my lifetime. Uh, but I do think it's great. I mean, listen, there's a... It's a lot of football, a lot of good football players out there that honestly aren't even playing in the NFL right now. So the fact that you give them a number, another opportunity to you know show what they're made of, and you know some 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 of these guys, I remember some of the XFL guys from uh, a couple of years ago made it to the NFL. Um, so I you know I like Turpin from the Cowboys was the MVP of that league for uh, for a year. So I, I think honestly it's a great way for these guys to get another opportunity that maybe. You know they, they weren't having coming out of college um and so it, yeah it but allows these guys to prolong their careers when a lot of them would have to retire uh because they didn't really get a shot in the nfl so i, I think it's great and i don't I, no, it's, it's not really going to be overtaking the nfl in popularity anytime soon or even come close to it anytime soon but i do think it's a really good thing and, and it's cool to see a new football leagues pop up in the spring though for sure are they going to try and work with them as more of a direct farm league do you think um they might be able to uh, down the line. I think the NFL is probably in a wait and see mode with it. Just saying, okay, let's see how this goes. Cause we, we've seen so many of these leagues pop up before and they flame out pretty quickly. Um, I think this one is built to last a little bit better, but uh, I think the NFL, yeah, the NFL is obviously going to look, I mean, we're actually PFF uh, is going to be grading the UFL. Um, so I'm sure the NFL will look at those grades and look at, you know, how the best players are playing and say, okay, you know, if we need this position, we know this guy is the highest grade at this position. He's unbelievable for them this year. Let's bring him in for a tryout, see what he could do. I think that'll be something that they could do, but I, I don't think it's going to be a direct feeder system to the NFL anytime soon. I think the NFL is still probably going to, it's still in a wait and see mode for that, uh, for that aspect. All right. Um, unless you have anything else, I think we're going to jump into the draft. No, let's, let's, let's do it. All right, so we're going to jump into, well, if you're new here, we do a snake draft sometimes, just whenever we have time. Today we're doing, in honor of the draft, uh, number one picks. So uh, I'm going to let Max choose his spot. So the snake draft, just like in fantasy, um, you can be one, two, or three. And, you know, you snake around. Okay, I'm going to take, give me the number one overall picks. I think there's a pretty clear one, one here. So I'm going to take the number one. <laughs> Man, you took my spot. I, <laughs> I, know, I know who you're going to take, and I'm going to want him. Mike, you want uh, two or three? I'll take three. I'll take All right, three. I'm, I'm going to be stuck with two. All right, All right Max, give me, give me number one. Uh, I'm going to go with the guy who is currently, and I say currently because I think Mahomes might pass him soon, but I think currently the second best quarterback in NFL history, uh, and that is Peyton Manning. The, uh, the Colts quarterback went number one in, I think, 98 was the year. Uh, yep. Yeah, he's uh, – you, know, you look back at a lot of these number one picks, man, a lot of them just don't work out. And I don't even think it's a, it's a problem with um, 
the player himself. I mean, it's obvious that, you know, the NFL is in a league where the worst team gets the first overall pick. That means you're going to a bad situation. Payton is one of the few quarterbacks that actually made that situation work, uh, honestly. Yeah. So won a Super Bowl with the Colts, uh, then won another with the uh, with the Broncos. Like I said, I think he's probably right now the second greatest quarterback in NFL history as of right now behind Tom Brady. Um, four, I think, MVPs, maybe even more than that. Um, he is literally one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, honestly. And I think this is a pretty clear 1-1. One, one, and um, also plays the most important position on the field as well. So I think uh, Peyton Manning is pretty clearly the uh, the number one, number one overall pick of all time. Peyton Manning, five-time five time MVP. Five-time, yeah. Damn. Yeah, monster. Um, I'm going to go – there. there is a guy, and I don't, I don't tip picks. That's not my thing. Um, but there is a guy that I have a little higher than this guy as an overall player, but I think this one is the sexier pick to take. I'm going to take – Former Baltimore Colt, mm -hmm. John Elway. Um, you know, the Ursay, uh, Robert Ursay, what what can we say about that? But John Elway, I would say pretty he worked out. I mean, he worked out as the number one pick, and I don't think you could have expected much more. I know he had trouble getting over the hump in the beginning, but Peyton had trouble getting over the hump yeah. sort of in the beginning. And they both got there and I think Elway's proved himself. And he's a he's a pretty good executive too, I would say. Yeah, he is. That was a good pick, honestly. Well, so you guys went with a sexy pick. I'm going with the – I'm going way, way back. I'm going – okay, so 14 number one overall picks are in the Hall of Fame. And it goes as far back as the guy that I'm well, – actually, no, it goes back to 19 – the earliest Hall of Famer was drafted in 42. I'm going Chuck Bednarik. Mm. Yeah, he was a eight-time <laughs> pro bowler. He was a center, and he is considered one of the hardest-hitting linebackers of all time. Now, I know I have to do a little more research on him now, but I've heard the name many times over the years, and it's going to be so easy to have recency bias. And, of course, you know, there's nothing – I can't argue with taking Manning and Elway one, too. But Chuck Bettenerick was a center and a linebacker. Let me have a number one overall picks did that. Had a nice – a really nice 14-year uh, career – with the Eagles, 10-time first-team All-Pro, 8-time Pro Bowler, uh, NFL's 50s All-Decade team. How can you not? How can I not? Yeah. I'm going to Chuck Bednarik, number three. Oh, and then I get the number four pick. Yeah, you get the number four as <laughs> yeah, well. snake drafts work. Um, well, out of principle, I can't put you – know, O.J. Simpson, I hope he tumbles way down this list. <laughs> he was a great player, but, you know, I mean – I was – he was, he was on my he was list. On list. He was on my list but, of – Possible. <laughs> and there's some great, some other great names on here, but it's it's hard for me to ignore a four-time Super Bowl winning quarterback. So I'm going mm -hmm. Bradshaw. So I'm going back to the traditional quarterback route with my number four pick because Terry won four rings, and he's a hell of a broadcaster and a hell of an actor. Absolutely. As a Steelers fan, yeah. I appreciate that pick a lot. Yeah. No, you are. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I'm sure. Pick. I'm sure you're happy right now with you know another Steeler quarterback. Yep. Um, I'm going to go – oh, this one just fell right to me. I'm going to go Buffalo Bill, defensive end. Damn. Bruce Smith, just monster. If you've ever played Tech Mobile, I've played Tech Mobile. He is a monster in Tech Mobile, just unstoppable. Um, a lot of my older football knowledge comes from Tech Mobile because my dad, me and him, would play it a lot, and we still play it sometimes. But he would always teach me. And the Colts were so bad at that time that you would play with other teams too. Dude, Bruce Smith, I uh, look at it right now, he's 1980s All-Decade team and 1990s All-Decade team. That's, that's uh, insane. That's absolutely insane, yeah. So he's one of the greatest defense players of all time. He still has, a, uh, still has the record for most career sacks in NFL history, too. So, um, yeah, Bruce Smith was literally going to be my next pick uh, if he got to me. But uh, it's a good pick. Man, there's a couple – I don't want to tip picks here. There's one here that I'm looking at that I just don't want to pick because I think he's one of the most overrated quarterbacks to ever play in the NFL. Uh, so I'm not going to pick him there. Um, I, I, think I, I, think I, I think I know who you're talking about too. Holy yeah, shit, <laughs> dude! He's I, I'm not I'm not a fan of him. Uh, I think he's very much a product of what he was around. Um, is he an announcer? He's going to come on he, here. He is, and he is an announcer. Angelo he is an announcer. Okay. Is, yes, very prominent announcer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great wanna... announcer too. Really good announcer. Uh, nothing against him as an announcer. Uh, I just think as a player, he was he, get, again great player. Just I think what he's being talked about as is wildly overrated. Um, 
I'm going to go with, you know, I, I know Michael said it. He wants him to tumble uh, off field aside. I am going to take OJ yeah. Simpson. No. OJ Simpson was, is probably, you know, again, off field aside, what a top 10 running back to ever play. Um, I, I don't agree now with uh, taking running backs as highly, um, but I will say back then they were valuable. And I think, uh, Again, off field aside, he he was one of the greatest running backs to ever play the game. So I, I'll go with OJ Simpson here. I don't love the pick because of everything that happened with him, uh, but I will go with him here as my uh, my other guy. He had two thousand yards in a fourteen game season. Yeah, that's absurd. Absurd. insane. Yeah, great and, actor and, too. Really good and he was great. Yeah. The Naked Gun movies were fantastic. He was Nordberg. I mean, of course, this was before anybody knew about all the other stuff. But it, <laughs> he was yeah, he was really funny in those yeah. movies. All right, you got another one, Max. Oh, correct. Uh, man, I, man, it's tough. These number one overall picks, is, a lot of them just didn't hit, man. So you're looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of like not great guys. I, um, yeah. Orlando Pace, man. Orlando Pace. Uh, you know, unfortunately, PFF wasn't really around when he was playing uh, until actually the, the latter half of his career before he really became a, a player, a great player. But um, one of the greatest offensive tackles probably of all time. I know one of the greatest tackle prospects of all time. Um, Hall of Famer. Uh, I, I think, you know, he's a guy that I would love to have as my kind of my left tackle. Uh, and I, I think he has really been, you know, one of the biggest parts of that whole greatest show on turf uh, team that they had in, in L.A. In, in 1999. So uh, I think Orlando Pace, again, not a sexy pick, maybe, but uh, I, I think he's one of the greatest ever at his position. So I think it's a, a pretty solid pick here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that, that was perfect. Um, I'm going to go. I'm not going to take that one guy that you were talking about. I'm going to go Earl Campbell. Um, yeah. Rookie year, 1,400 yards. I see 1,900 and 1,980, which they were still at 14 games at that point in 1980. No, Is that right? Just gone to Did 16, they go to 16? 78, I think. Still, uh, 1,900 yards. Pretty damn good. Um, and what was this? I had another one written down. I don't know. But still, Earl Campbell, monster. I still wish the Houston Oilers were a team. I would much rather have them than the they Tennessee Titans. The jerseys, they had the throwbacks this year. So that's nice that's blasphemous to me that the Tennessee Titans are wearing Houston Oilers jerseys. I yeah. get, oh, the franchise owns it. I don't care. That's the city. Those yeah. are the city's uniforms. The city of Houston deserves them. Give them back. And then the University of Houston tried to wear them too, and they got uh, like knocked down by the NFL. Yeah. No, I, I think the thing with Earl Campbell that really is amazing about his career too is that man, he put up all those stats and all those you know amazing counting stats. He's probably the greatest power back of all time. So he, all like Derrick Henry in a lot of ways, where it's just like you get this guy the ball like four times a game, he was just killing guys, and you would think that that would wear him down, and it really didn't. And so I, I think Derrick Henry is kind of a good modern day comp for him because it's just like it's unbelievable. Like every other running back that gets the amount of workload that Derrick Henry has breaks down pretty quickly, and yet Derrick Henry's still going right now. Uh, and now a free agent, we'll see where he goes. But yeah, it's just Earl Campbell's career is so amazing to me, is because he was such an amazing player. Even though I mean, he was taking hard, hard hits, basically thirty times a game for the uh, for the Oilers. Mm -hmm. All right, Mike. Yeah, I mean, you guys were really just bad mouthing Angelo Bertelli, weren't you? Nineteen forty four, first overall pick from Notre Dame. <laughs> now, um, uh, well, if I love the Orlando Pace pick, so I'm going to bookend that dream offensive line with Ron Yeri, mm -hmm. who was named to uh, seven consecutive Pro Bowls to start his career. Now, he played 14 years. He's a Hall of Famer, both college football and pro football Hall of Famer. I guess that's to be expected, right? You know, I mean, yeah. that's be a good study to look at. Is every, you know, pro football Hall of Famer, are they also in the college football Hall of Fame? That's well, another. Kurt Warner, definitely not. Definitely not Kurt yeah. Warner. <laughs> that's a great point, yes. Um Probably like Marshall Falk. I don't know. But um, no, Ron Yeri had an incredible career. He only missed two games in uh, 14 seasons for the Vikings due to injury. Wow. Uh, Six-time first-team All-Pro, seven-time Pro Bowler, 70s All-Decade team. Um, again, I don't. I know pro football focus wasn't around in, 19, in the 1970s. Would have been nice to see what Yeri's measurables were, but mm -hmm. he is wearing a gold jacket, and I think he uh, is very deserving of the what what am i number nine in this game this is the ninth. yeah this is not yeah. yeah perfectly fitting so now we've got our bookend offensive line oh, offensive lineman um okay number 10 well i you know what i'm gonna take the guy whose highway i drive on here sometime oh. i'm going i'm going leroy selman Damn. uh say so, yeah i heard a I heard a groan there 
six-time Pro Bowler, Pro Football Hall of Famer, truly the first great Tampa Bay Buck, right? Yeah. Now, he was he was drafted in 76, and as we remember, or we may remember, the 76 Bucks are famous for being, right? It was the 76 Bucks that were winless. They were the first winless team, and for a long time, the only winless team in NFL history. That was a 14-game season. Let me see. Until the yeah. Lions oh, and the 14. Browns. Yeah, until yep. the Lions and the Browns. Uh, and that was the famous quote John McKay he said. They asked him about his team's execution. He said, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> One of the great all-time lines <laughs> talking about his Bucks team. Uh, but Leroy Selman was like the linchpin. When they, they turned it around, they made it to the NFC Championship game in 1979. Um, and just a great defensive player. Great defensive end. Had a nice, long career. Played all, well. I guess back then, nine years considered a long career, 70s and 80s. But he was six-time yeah. Pro Bowler, three-time All-Pro. Um, he had, looking at his, let's see how many career sacks he had. But, no, I feel very good. I feel very good about him, uh, even though he only had 23 career sacks, but he had 28. How do you have 28 and a half career force fumbles? I'm not sure. But that's how good he is. He, he knew how to get half of a force fumble. They might have, uh, <laughs> when did they start counting sacks? So that might have been while he was playing. Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point. That's um, a really good point. Yeah, and the not whole nine season. I know he had like a bad back that made him retire early. So I mean, he could have had even better. He, he's a Hall of Famer. He could have had even better career if he had a bad back too. I mean, yeah, he's a legend. So I literally was my next pick if he, if he came around to me. So uh, that's a good pick. Um, I'm I'm gonna show my age here. I'm really gonna show my age because these guys are the guys I really grew up with. Um, they're both quarterbacks. First one, Cam Newton. Cam Newton was one of the – when Cam was was Cam, he was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen, I think. Like that that 2014 or 2015 season, I don't care about the Super Bowl. Cam Newton was one of the best athletes I've ever seen step on the field. He's just a monster, like physically imposing, just – I mean, he couldn't last, but Cam, I think Cam Newton deserves it more than anybody. Okay. Yeah. That's a good pick. That was another one I was looking at right there. Uh, so am I up right here? I have two picks? Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to take two quarterbacks as well. Um, I'm going to go with – I'll go with Eli Manning first. So I got the two Manning brothers on my team. Uh, Eli, good – always been a good quarterback. Never obviously reached a legendary status as Peyton, except for in two games he did, uh, which were in the Super Bowl against Tom Brady and the Patriots. First one – I think it was maybe the first Super Bowl I ever remember watching fully – uh, was the 07 one against, uh, obviously, the undefeated Pats. Greatest upset maybe in sports history. Uh, and one of the most legendary moments ever when he breaks out of the sack, launches it to David Tyree, helmet catch. Next Super Bowl, he plays Tom Brady again. Um, as the I think one of the greatest throws in NFL history that doesn't get talked about enough is that sideline throw to Mario Manningham. Mm-hmm. Uh, between I think it was double coverage. and Manningham made an unbelievable catch to getting his feet down. Uh, I, I personally, that's probably a top three throw ever for me, uh, considering how important that stage was when he threw it. Um, so, again, really good quarterback for his whole career. And two games against the greatest quarterback of all time, he was legendary. So, uh, I think Eli Manning, again, a guy who was drafted like John Elway, pulled John Elway, uh, where he was drafted by one team to, and refused to play for that team. So he went to a different team. Uh, Eli went to the Chargers originally, and then obviously he got traded on draft day to uh, the Giants. And one of the funniest pictures ever is Eli giving an awkward smile, holding up the Chargers jersey when he was when he was drafted because <laughs> yeah. everyone knew he didn't want to go there. Um, so, yeah, I think it's pretty funny that Eli and John Elway both did that, and, and honestly it worked out for them. So um, I would go with him. And the other quarterback I'll go with is Matthew Stafford, who uh, – oh. Again, great career. Always been an unbelievable quarterback in Detroit. Uh, then he gets traded away to the Rams, wins a Super Bowl with them. Again, like Eli Manning, had a really legendary performance in the Super Bowl. Uh, cool for him to get a ring. Always been one of the you know best quarterbacks ever, just for stats-wise. Um, Going to be up there in passing yards uh, when his career is over. Uh, I, I think he's a Hall of Famer um, with Eli Manning, probably. So I, I would say those are the two guys I'd probably go with is Eli Manning and uh, and Matthew Stafford. Yeah, great picks. I'm gonna go with the. I'm gonna be the homer. I have to do it. Andrew Luck, my yeah. favorite quarterback of all time. He turned that two and two and fourteen Colts team immediately into a playoff team, 
and then went to the playoffs three straight years. They were climbing a ladder, climbing a ladder, and then his lacerated kidney. And some Colts fans hate him for some reason. I don't. He was taking care of his body. I, I think your body is more important than any football game ever. Um, and we didn't surround him with the best. Uh, so Andrew Luck, he's. I mean, he's just my guy. I mean, he he did show he was he was what he lived up to for about four seasons, four or five, or what he was built up to, four or five seasons. Even if I lose the draft. Yeah, he, he was great, man. It's it's unfortunate that we never really got to see what his full career could have been because I think he would have been up there with the all-time greats. But uh, even in, in the limited you know years that we got with him, he was still phenomenal. So uh, one of the few that I think really just lived up to, to the hype he had. Like he had like – he, Peyton Manning, John Elway had this crazy hype coming out of college, and they all lived up to it. Uh, I think Trevor Lawrence had the same hype, and we'll see if he can live up to it. I think yeah. he can. Um, and I think Caleb Williams is probably one just one step down below them. So we'll see what he could do with that hype too. But – uh, Do you yeah. think Burrow had that hype? I think he did. I would – no, not with – I would not put him on the same level as Luck, Lawrence, and Elway and Peyton. Um, I think they had a level – like Lawrence we knew for three years. We knew Lawrence – and I, I was seeing articles – I love recruiting too as, as a college guy. So I was seeing articles about Lawrence when he was in eighth grade being like, this kid's special. Uh, then all of high school, he was the number one player in the country. Went to Clemson, won a national title in his first year. Um, and was one of the best quarterbacks in, in college football history, honestly, over his three years. So I think Burrow was different because Burrow had the one year, which is great, but Burrow only had one year, really, where it's like, oh, this guy blew up at it. It's kind of like a Cam Newton year. I, I wouldn't put up Cam Newton as one of the greatest quarterback prospects ever either. So um, that's why I would probably say Burrow's one step down below, um, and i probably put Caleb on the same level as Burrow as in that regard as a prospect. But, yeah, I think Luck, Lawrence, Elway – Peyton Manning, like they, they were a different level. Yeah, it's weird too. Andrew Luck always struck me as a guy that, like, he he was a like a he wasn't a football player, but he was in a football player's body, and he had he made some just incredible throws. Like yeah. on the run, I remember that New England playoff game in the rain. He made some absurd yeah. throws. Guys surrounding him, I and mean, he the pure talent, amazing. So I'm I'm with you, Max. He was he was in love with concrete. That, that's like one of his favorite things to talk about. He would read books about concrete, concrete? on the on that's the team bus amazing. to go to go to games. He would and he would be driving. They'd be driving by and he'd go look like that. You know, he'd point out the concrete. He'd point out the designs. And guys were like, "What the fuck is this guy talking about?" <laughs> what about concrete? There's Why don't you focus a, on the game? <laughs> there's a great article. Um, someone did it a couple years ago uh, from ESPN. I, I wish I could credit the writer because was, was it Zach Kiefer? Kiefer? I think it was. Yeah, it was, it was like just kind of like where, where has Andrew Luck been? It's just been like him yeah. like in a, in a wooden cabin, right, over the last few years. He's just like <laughs> he's just off the face of the earth, really, uh, living his life with his family, which I think is awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm very happy for him that he, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of these guys don't retire before their body breaks down. He was lucky enough to know, hey, I, I got to get out of here. Um, so yeah. I'm really happy for him. He's obviously got a great life now. Um, but it, there always will be kind of like a, a whole what if, you know, because the whole Andrew Luck was starting to reach, you know, superstar level status. He actually was at that level already. So him walking away from the game, I'll never forget where I was when I found out that news because it, it was it was a, definitely like a where were you when moment. because It was a, one of the biggest stories I can remember in the NFL, honestly. He was such a big part of my just childhood. You know, when you're a kid, sports are everything to you and you look up to these guys like I still talk about Andrew Luck and I well a little bit. I'll well up a little bit, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. What are you doing welling up over a man, like another guy, you know, a fo an athlete? Like, I love right. football, but I'm like, don't cry over this guy. But I'm like, I can't help it. Like, he gave me so many happy and sad memories, and I'm doing it again. I'm just going to yeah. stop talking. <laughs> uh, Final pick. We got we got to go. I got to give the old guys again some love here. I, I'm going back to the 50s and Paul Horning who, again, just like Chuck Bednarik, actually was not only a great halfback, he was also a kicker. So that was back when it was like you couldn't talk smack about kickers when they're also your halfback, right? And Paul Hornig, um, he was on the uh, – so his last year with the Packers, basically his last year in the NFL, was the first ever Super Bowl. But he did win four championships. Um, this was really before a lot of, like, Big time accolades, but he was uh, just a linchpin of those Lombardi teams and just passed away a few years ago in 2020. Uh, lived a good life, 84, but um, he was a Heisman winner. Appreciate that as a college guy, Notre Dame guy. Um, and I I just think he, you know, it, it's it's hard because we, we kind of think of these players in different eras and we just automatically assume like, oh, today that yeah, they probably wouldn't be. But we really never got to appreciate how great they were, even if it was in a different era. And uh, and Paul Hornig was 
was pretty damn good. So he I'm going to go with him. There's, a, there's an really award awesome. in college football now called the Paul Horning Award, and it's given out to mm-hmm. the most versatile player in college football every year. So that just shows you, you know, how amazing he was as a college player. Obviously, yeah, he's been, he had a great NFL career too. So, yeah, I, I think it's a very worthy pick. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to the real NFL draft, I'm going to give a couple of uh, honorable oh. mentions. Um, Mike Vick, num- I mean, just hell Pure of an excitement. athlete. Pure excitement. Yeah. Bo Jackson, again, yep. one of those guys if injuries yeah. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what was the other one I had? Uh, I lost my spot. Here. I think, oh, I think we Jeff can George. Give, yeah. Jeff <laughs> Another Colts. <laughs> I think we can give now. I think we can give credit to Troy Aikman. I think this is the point. I'm glad none of us took him. I think Troy Aikman now, now we can give him the credit. Cause I think he does deserve to get a shout out here. He was a six time pro bowler, did win MVP, uh, three time Super Bowl champ. Again, those Cowboy teams were freaking loaded. Uh, he's a lot like Brock. He was a lot like the Brock Purdy of those Cowboy teams, if you will. Um, but he is a three-time champ, did win MVP, so I'll give him love there. But I, 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 I do, you know, uh, I hold people who, who kind of put him up there as one of the greatest ever. Like I don't, I don't think he's even close to it. But uh, he was, a, he was a solid enough quarterback, and he did, you know, tuck three rings. So I, I'll, I'll give him credit for that, for uh, for doing that for sure. I'm going to throw in a few of the Hall of Famers that did not get picked. Uh, 1942 running back Bill Dudley, 1945 uh, running back Charlie Trippy. Trippy? Did I say that right? It was trippy. Um, honorable mentions for sure. Uh, and I got to throw some love to Keyshawn Johnson because say what you will about him as kind of a diva, but had a pretty good NFL career. And uh, yeah. it, despite, you know, despite writing a book that was called Throw Me the Damn Ball. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And uh, yeah, Drew, I mean, Drew Bledsoe obviously had a really good career. Mm-hmm. Uh, Irving fought, Fryer. Well, yeah, Irving Fryer. I mean, w- I would uh, the the fun exercise would be the two all time Jones, bust yeah. or two tall Jones Bubba Smith, um, who was also an actor. But I think the fun draft would be who are the all time worst. Oh, right? there's, there's, probably, there's probably a better, probably a way more listed names than uh, than yeah. Here. But uh, no, that's good, man. I, I like the uh, I like those shout out. I love how you got all the like the the forties, man. You're bringing out the forties on us. I think that's yeah. great. Um, I mean, you know, I, we were talking about this. We gotta love the history, right? There's so much of this game is about just the history and how we got here. And so yeah. these players that right so easily forgotten because they were from many moons ago. Yeah. No, dude, all right. I think well, great let's jump into the. Uh, yeah, um, let's jump into the real draft. Uh, so we probably have about 20 minutes or so. Um, so I want to start out with the. Probably perennial number one pick. Mm-hmm. I'm curious about the temperature of all these GMs about or around his off the field antics. So the finger painting and the dress and the magazine and the crying in the stands with his mom. I think it's I think just some guys are different and they do different things. But some people say, you know, they're a little more dramatic about it. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you firsthand it's complete BS. What's going on with this kid? Uh, I. I... It is the character assassination that is going on with Caleb Williams is some of the worst I've ever seen. Some, literally is some of the worst I've ever seen. I am, I, I honestly, I'm getting mad for this kid now. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I keep telling people and they keep saying, oh, character issues. It's like, dude, look at what these media has been doing to him. And he still hasn't snapped yet. That should tell you what kind of character this kid has. If I was him and I kept having all this stuff come out about me that's complete BS, I would have snapped. I, in fact, I was at the combine. First question was asked that he literally walks to the podium, says, "Hey, good morning, everybody." Like really chipper. First question goes, "Hey, Caleb, you scared to compete?" And he's like, "What?" <laughs> he's like, well, "Okay, Kate, you didn't, you didn't, you're not working out the combine. You're out uh, doing your meta. Like, you, are you scared to compete?" And it's like, "Okay, first of all, Drake May's also not working out. Jaden Daniels is not working out. Marvin Harrison Jr. is not working out. What does that tell you? It tells you these kids have nothing, have everything to lose by working out. So he's not the only one." So I, we all like I, I'm telling you, man. Everyone just kind of you know darted and looked at and looked at that reporter who asked, him, like, "Are you a moron? Like, what, are you an idiot?" He handled it perfectly. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to interview him last year, for, uh, actually at the combine last year, uh, for like 20 minutes one on one. And great kid, su- uber competitive. If you have any, if you have any uh, qualms about his competitiveness, I can tell you that it's not. He's he's one of those competitive people I've ever met. But uh, afterwards, um, a lot of outlets started taking quotes from my piece on him and making up quotes and saying he said this in a, in a really like horrible quote that does not look good on him 
And I had to message them and be like, hey, this is like fake. Like, this, please take this down. And they're like, oh, how do you know it's fake? And I go, well, it says via Max Chadwick and I'm Max Chadwick. <laughs> so that's how I know it's fake. And they go, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry, we'll take it down. So I'm, I'm telling these people right now, I'm telling you that because there are a lot of stories that are coming out by this guy that are 1,000% false. 1,000% false. I, I, I cannot believe there have been many red flags off the field for plenty of other prospects. And we are making up some for this kid right now. Is he different? Yeah, he is different. He's, he's a different kind of quarterback than we're used to. And I think that maybe rubs some people the wrong way, but all of his teammates love him, love him. And all of his coaches love him. So what does that tell you? That tells you there's nothing wrong with him off the field. He's just a different kind of guy. And I think that rubs people the wrong way. So I think, again, like I said, the character assassination with Caleb Williams is, is some of the worst I've ever seen. And honestly, I'm, I'm getting a little, uh, I'm, I know I'm teed off right now, man. I, I have been teed off for a long time because I, I truly feel bad for the kid because I, I don't think any of it is deserved, honestly. Yeah, man, that's well, that's rough, too. I mean, yeah. th- and this is where, like, you know, we talk about the supposed purity of college football. I mean, these are these are young, yeah, very young men. You know, this isn't like a 45-year-old guy being torn apart for something who mm-hmm. maybe has a, you know, different perspective on life. This is a, a young individual who, yes, he's got a lot of, Supposedly a lot of fame and fortune coming his way, but you're right. It, it it makes no sense. And we're in this, we're in this era of like, well, everybody's actually super hypersensitive and yet you have a lot of behavior like this still going on. Yeah. So it baffles me how hypocritical people. It's through really the goalpost be. moving. It was so funny to me when they were like, Oh, he doesn't care about football at all. And then all of a sudden, like he's crying in the stance of his mom. They're like, Oh, he cares too much. Now it's like the goalpost moving yeah. with him has been unbelievable. So listen, the, I don't the nail paint thing. Um, the whole F Utah and all that. Uh, I thought it was funny. Um, I, that rubbed people the wrong way. It's kind of like a whole bit, like, kind of like to me, it felt like a little Baker Mayfield a little bit. Yeah. I, I actually asked him about that. He's like, yeah, man, I, I, I do. I'm not going to do that anymore. Like I, I realized afterwards I have kids looking up to me and I, I can't be setting that example. So he, he stopped doing it. So like, again, he's a young kid who did that originally thought it was funny. It was funny. Uh, and then now he's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Cause I have kids looking up to me and all that. He has a lot of, he has a lot of charity stuff off the field. And he's a whole Caleb cares foundation is doing incredible stuff. Um, this kid is an unbelievable person that I think it's, it's so unfair and, and awful that of what's going on with him right now. And to me, it is incredible that he hasn't snapped on the media yet and, and been like, and getting pissed off. Cause I would have snapped by now. And it, that should tell you all you need to know about the kid and that he's, you know, taking all the shit and he's answering every question um, nicely and politely, even though the questions are ridiculous. Um, I, again, that should tell you everything you need to know about Caleb Williams and all of the people around him love him. That's all you need to care about, honestly. And I, I, he's a terrific prospect. He's a terrific person off the field. There are no red flags with this character. He's just a different kind of person. I think that rubs people the wrong way, and I, I'm undeservedly so, in my opinion. And and you told me too that he is he, that he's got an, uh, just an abundance of confidence, right? Like yeah. he was talking about comparing himself a little bit to Mahomes recently, right? And you tell me there was kind of like he, he said something about that, about like comparing himself and the skill set. Yeah, he did. Uh, I asked him about that because I was like, hey, listen, you're getting comps to Mahomes, dude. And he's like, yeah, like I, I do some things. I think there's a lot of things he does better than me. I think I do some things better than him, which is, you know, again, it might rub people the wrong way when you say that. But, dude, you got to be confident. Like, you got to be you got to be a cocky guy, honestly, in this league. You know, you, you can't go out there saying, oh, this guy's better than me and that guy's better than me. But hopefully I can, you know, maybe. Get... No, 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 man. You got to go out there and say I'm the best in the damn world right now. And that's what he's got. Uh, he's got that cockiness. He's got that swagger to him. Uh, again, rubs people the wrong way. It shouldn't rub people the wrong way. That's what you want your quarterback to be. Um, and and t- unless it hurts his relationship with his teammates and his coaches, there's no issue from it from me. So uh, I, I have no issue with that. I love his com- I loved his confidence. I love his swagger. Um, he even said, I think he said uh, the quote was to me, he said, I want to make you, I want to destroy you. I want to make you feel like a pauper. Uh, every time I go out there when I, uh, when I play and I was like, that that's an incredible word that you just brought out, um, you know, to say that, but yeah, I love Caleb Williams, dude. And I just, again, I, I think he's a slam dunk, number one overall pick. I think he's one of the best quarterback prospects we've seen in the last decade plus. Um, and I think all the off field stuff is just because people can't really find too many negatives with his on field play. So they're starting to make up stuff about his off field stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I have no qualms with selecting Caleb Williams, the number one overall pick in this draft. All right. I, that, Bears are on the clock. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> they got to um, They have to do it. They have to. We were talking about this, right? You got that moment. And it, well, do we want to just experiment one more year with fields? No, I mean, you got no. a guy who, it's as over. you said, yeah. is the best prospect in 10 years. 
you're taking them. That's why you made the trade with Carolina last year mm -hmm. to be in this position. Yeah. And, and I guess more on quarterback. So I think this might be one of the more quarterback needy seasons for, for teams. Like there's yeah. so many teams out there that need a quarterback. How many do you think are going to get drafted? Uh, in the first round? Yeah. I think Caleb is a, is a lock. Drake is a lock. Jaden's a lock. Uh, JJ at this point is a lock. Those are the four I'm I'm really confident. And honestly, dude, they might go four of the top five, honestly. I, I think there's a, there's a chance that someone trades up into the top five. Like, I think right now, I mean, I have no idea where Justin Fields is going to go. And honestly, I don't even know if Justin Fields is going to go to a spot where he's the starter next year at this point. Because um, there's a lot of teams that are filling their knees. We saw it today with Atlantic and Kirk Cousins. Um, the Raiders seem to be con content with going with uh, Gardner Minshew and uh, in O'Connell, maybe to draft someone too. But I think the two teams I'm really looking at right now that are going to be desperate to get up to get J.J. McCarthy is probably Minnesota and Denver. Um, and they might trade with the fifth overall pick, the Chargers. Um, and also the conspiracy theory, Jim Harbaugh, obviously the new coach of the Chargers. Maybe he'll trade that pick to try to get his boy, J.J., to get in the top five. Um, I don't think that's probably all that it goes into it too. But I think J.J. is going to rise on a lot of boards. And I think Sean Payton, Kevin O'Connell, they're really going to want that guy. Uh, I think quarterbacks are probably going to go one, two, three at this point. Obviously with Mac Jones now gone from New England uh, to Jacksonville. Uh, so I think you see Caleb. And then either Drake or Jaden at number two. I personally think Drake should be the clear number two guy, but I know Jaden's kind of the hot name for a lot of people. Um, I think Bo and Penix have a shot to go in the first round. It really depends on how desperate a team is. Like maybe a Las Vegas would take one of them. There are that, that Those two are a little tricky, though. I think those two, I could see both of them slipping to the second round. I could see one of them, like Penix has been rising up a lot of boards recently after his combine and all the medicals checked out for him, which is huge. He could be a still a first round pick, but I think the four that are definites are Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, and JJ McCarthy. And then I would probably say Michael Penix Jr. I'd feel I'd probably say might be a first round pick. And then Bo Nix is, is more like a 50 50 for me in my right now. But yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see what quarterbacks uh, needy teams are still out there after our uh, free agency ends, too. Yeah. Um, I, I also have a question about Joe Milton. I love Joe Milton. I love the fact that he threw an orange 108 <laughs> yards on the fly. He's got a rocket arm. He's if, if you want him to throw it 60, he'll throw it 60. If you want it 20, he'll throw it 60. I mean, are, is he is he like a sixth, seventh rounder right now? Is that a pretty reasonable yeah. assessment? That's a, I love that. That's a good quote, man. If, if you want 20, he's going to throw it 60. That's literally what he's going to do. Um, yeah. Man, he, he's going to walk into the NFL day one with probably a top five strongest arm in the league. And usually for a lot of guys – that would get them picked very highly. Problem with him is that, man, he is all over the place. Uh, is, mm -hmm. If you're going to turn this guy into a starter, which I don't – I would say there's like a 10% chance that that could happen, uh, you're going to need a lot of work. I mean, this is a guy that's going to be sitting there. Like he's going to need the Jordan Love treatment, where he's even three-plus years, even more than that maybe. Uh, he had a bad year at Tennessee this past season. Um, again, he's got a cannon, absolute rifle of an arm. I, he, I think he said before he could throw like 90-plus yards if he wanted to. Uh, which is nuts, but the problem is that it, it's gonna, you don't know where it's going to go, honestly. So, uh, he's, again, he's going to have one of the strongest arms in the league day one, but it, the problem is that you just you never know where that ball is going to go. And uh, I, I'm I'm lower on him just because I think he's super raw, and uh, it's going to take a lot of work by a team to to get him to be a starting caliber quarterback. But you know, if you if you do that work, you know there is a ceiling there, but I just I don't think it's very reachable for him, honestly. I, I think. Uh, a, day, a late day three pick is probably where he's going to end up being. That's probably where I take him. Yeah. I, I just, I love the guys with the big arms. It's just, yeah. it doesn't it's matter how good they yeah. are. They could be, they could be whole, like just the worst player of all time, but if they can throw it far, it's, yep. it's fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> um, Mike, you have anything? I've been taking all the questions. No, no, I've just been, I've just been enjoying hearing the, you know, getting the crash course on, on everything. So it sounds like we're all in agreement though on who's going Number one, I know you wanted to ask though about the the combine too. If like any of these free agent moves, if you kind of saw those coming, or just you know overheard GMs having conversations late night at the bars there, or coaches just blurt things out, you just picked up on that. 
Um, good question. Yeah, you hear some stuff. Uh, uh, I would say the Kirk Cousins to Atlanta stuff, I was hearing a lot of the combine, so I, I had an inkling that that was going to end up happening. They did not know it was going to be for four years. That's that's nuts. And Kirk Cousins, yeah, I was shocked. Kirk Cousins, man, he's going to go in the Sports Business Hall of Fame for what the amount of money this guy's getting paid. Didn't I, say, his, I said that walking in here. I was like, this guy is, is he is the best businessman in the NFL. It is by far. I mean, he is just getting fully guaranteed <laughs> deals left and right. I mean, his agent deserves a spawn can in Ohio, honestly. For what yeah. he's been doing, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, I think that was uh, something I heard. I've heard uh, I've heard that Washington is is, pret- is potentially looking at trading up to number one. I don't know how open Chicago would be to that, but obviously Caleb Williams being from DC, uh, Cliff Kingsbury now the new offensive coordinator at Washington. He was Caleb Williams' quarterback coach at USC this past season. They got a relationship there. I, I think it really matches up in a lot of ways. I don't think Caleb Williams is going to pull, you know, speaking of before, John Elway or, or Eli Manning, he's not going to do that. He will play for Chicago, but I do think he prefers Washington, uh, which makes sense. I mean, it's his hometown. He's got his old coach there as well. Um, so I think he prefers Washington, but he would play in Chicago. He's not going to refuse to play in Chicago or anything like that. So I'm curious to see if Chicago was, is willing to do that and what the price would be for them to move out of that pick. I personally, if I'm Chicago, I'm not trading away that pick because I don't want to they already passed Patrick Mahomes twice, you know, once I'm not going to make them do it twice, you know? So uh, I don't, I think that was something I heard a lot. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, But uh, I think that's something to keep an eye on for sure that, you know, maybe Chicago does trade out of that number one pick and trades back to number two. And maybe, maybe they stick with Justin Fields and and take Marvin Harrison Jr. I personally would hate that, but maybe they do that if they get a great haul from Washington to move back to number two. So that is something I should, I would think to keep an eye on. Uh, I don't. I don't know how realistic that actually is, though. Honestly, um, who do you think is going to be the most active on draft day? Just trades, stuff like that. I, I'm going to go back to what I said before. I think Minnesota and Denver uh, are going to be desperate. I, I, I think I've heard rumblings that Sean Payton is in love with JJ McCarthy. I think the Vikings also love JJ McCarthy. Um, I think that they're going to be really desperate to get up to get him because they're going to need to jump each other probably because um, he's not last to 11. One of them's going to trade up to get him. So I look a lot. I look at the Chargers at number five uh, as a team that might be willing to move out of that pick. I think the Chargers should move out of the pick because I, I'm them. I'm targeting Brock Bowers, and you could probably get Brock Bowers at 11 or 12, um, yeah. honestly too. So if you get a if you trade back, get an extra first round pick next year, and then get the guy you're ultimately going to select anyways, I guess a home run for the Chargers. So. Uh, I, I think I would keep an eye on the Broncos and the Vikings right now because I think those two are obviously have a glaring need of quarterback with Russell Wilson and Kirk Cousins both gone. Um, I think they're going to be the two teams that are really going to try to move up to get J.J. McCarthy probably somewhere in the top five, honestly. And then I have a, just a couple more Colts questions, and then I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, so the Colts, I feel like the Colts have boasted their cap space for the last – like five years. They're constantly like, we have the top four, top five, top three, whatever. And they don't spend. It seems like they might actually spend this year. They, you know, they re-signed Grover Stewart today. They re-signed Michael Pittman to that $70 million extension. Do you think they're going to be really active in, in signing guys outside of the organization? Or is it just going to be another, oh, this guy's a great character guy, you know, great locker room guy. We're going to sign him for two years, you know, $10 million. Uh, I think... I think they're going to settle down for now. I think they're very happy with getting the Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, extension done. Um, so I think they're happy with that. But I just, yeah, I mean, I mean, you're looking at them right now. There, there aren't really a ton of like. There are still some really high profile players left, but a lot of them were taken up today. So it's not like it's um, there's still a lot of great players out there. But yeah, I think the Colts still have you know, some moves they can make, but I just don't think they're going to, you know, break the bank on another player or anything like that, like a Daniel Hunter who's still out there or something like that. So um, I think they're happy with the, what they did today. Um, they should be happy. I think Grover Stewart's a really good player. I think Michael Payton Jr. is someone they needed to bring back when um, they did that. So I, I think they're going to make a, a couple more moves, maybe a couple more under the radar moves that are going to be really good. But I don't, I don't envision the Colts making maybe too many more splashes right now, at least. And then what's the what's the feeling around Anthony Richardson right now? Because we saw very short flashes from him. You know, he, he looked very good. He had one interception in the four games that he played. A lot of injuries, though. Mm-hmm. Um, so how are the execs kind of feeling about him? Is he is he going to be a threat next year? 
Uh, I think he will be. I actually another guy I want to shout out to uh, quickly. I think the signing of Taekwon Lewis for the Colts today too was really good. Uh, I think that was a really mm-hmm. good value signing. I think he's a solid player, for, the edge defender for him. I think that's a really solid signing for them too. But uh, going back to Anthony Richardson, I think he's a really he's intriguing man. He's a, he's really intriguing. He's like if Joe Millen was a lot better at football, honestly. Like that's kind of <laughs> what Anthony Richardson is. Um, I, he quite literally is. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say this. Because uh, there's actually a metric that, that can tell you this. He's the most athletic quarterback to ever test in the NFL combine. I think Cam Newton also did all the tests, too. So he's more, more athletic than Cam Newton, uh, according to Kent Lee Platt, who's a relative athletic score, which is really cool. Um, kind of measures how you test out of the combine and compares it to past players in your position. Uh, Anthony Richardson is a 100th percentile athlete. Uh, and that shows up on the field, too. I mean, he's got a rocket launcher of an arm. He can obviously is, is one of the top running quarterbacks in the NFL already, even though he hasn't really shown up too much either. Um, he's got a, such a high ceiling and the fact he's with Shane Steichen who helped turn Jalen Hurts into the really good quarterback he is, that makes me really excited to see what Anthony Richardson can do in year two. Again, there's still some issues you got to work out with him. He, he's not, you know, he, he wasn't even great at Florida. I mean, he, he had a lot of issues with inaccuracy. Um, but I think he's got good footwork, honestly, which is something you don't really see too often in young quarterbacks. He's got good footwork. Like I said, he's a great runner. He's got a can't have an arm. He's just got to rein it in a little bit, in my opinion. But if he does, man, I mean, this guy is one of the highest ceilings in the NFL um, in a league where all the quarterbacks who have high ceilings seem to be hitting them. Uh, I think he could be one of those guys because I, I love where he's at. I love the situation he's in. And I love the coach he's working with, too. Um, I, if I'm a Colts fan, I'm I'm very excited about Anthony Richardson next year. He might not be hit the ceiling next year immediately, but uh, I do think that there's uh, should be a lot of optimism in Indianapolis right now. Yeah, I've been I've been outspoken about Shane Steichen when it comes to just his play calling and some of the game management, like the Houston game, the way he called the ending there, just yeah. saying, "Oh, we have the ball with six minutes. We're gonna, you know, we're just gonna assume we're gonna score at some point." That drove me crazy, and our our audiences have heard me say that millions, millions of times. So I'm not gonna get too into it. Um, but I am really, I'm really hopeful for Richardson. I think he's, I've seen a lot of poise in the pocket. Like he yeah. is comfortable. He stands tall. He, he's not running away. Like he's not running away too much. He's not getting scared. He's not flinching. He stands there. He takes shots like that Aaron Donald um, hit that he took against the Rams and he launches one like 25 yards yeah. on a fucking rope. I mean, that was, that was sexy. I'll say that. Yeah. But uh, you got anything? I'm going to just, uh, fire one final question before we go. Again, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, and I think so much attention is paid to the, the big name guys, and we're so curious what's going to happen in these early rounds, but I'm, I'm a sucker for the underdog. You and I were talking a lot about Brock Purdy when we were chatting on the phone, and um, is there one guy, or even two guys maybe, that you know, you, you're really high on that you don't know is going to go maybe until late in the draft? Maybe, I know it'd be hard to say who's going to be a great undrafted player, but a, but a real sleeper like everybody wants to know is there going to be another tom brady type story or even a russell wilson who a third round pick a guy that you think could surprise some people oh good question man um i'm trying to get the quarterbacks here to, to make it you know more hype for you guys but i'm gonna yeah, say yeah. uh Give me my guy, man. Give me Jordan Travis uh, from Florida State. Now, I don't know how he's going to translate to the NFL level because I just don't think he's got the arm that can really, uh, like, play in the NFL. But, man, he's a great leader, great kid. I was able to interview him last year, too. Um, He actually quite literally is the only reason why Florida State was left out of the playoffs because he broke his leg in the uh, second to last game of the season. And wrongly, they were left out because of that, which I think is complete BS. But that's a whole other story for another time. Um, but yeah, I think Jordan Travis, he's probably going to go day three. Um, just an unreal college quarterback that I, he's going to be a great backup in the NFL. I don't think he'll ever be a starter, but I mean, Hey, Brock Purdy, I don't really think would be a starter either. And look where he's at. So, uh, if you're looking for like that kind of quarterback, probably Jordan Travis. Um, and then, yeah, I think, man, I think, uh, I think Joe Millen is probably the other guy. If you're really looking for the ultimate ceiling, that's going to go day three. If he hits it unbelievable he's just i just don't see him hitting it there's so so much work to do for him but that's the other guy too where you might look back on that and be like oh how did that guy go that low it's like oh well actually because he was not very good in college so that's why yeah. and why that's why he went very low but um if you're looking for like maybe the long-term starter down the line maybe joe millen but I, like i said i think i think we kind of know we're, we're getting a lot better at evaluation so we kind of are seeing these guys uh, there's not really too much that slips through the cracks anymore i know brock purdy did but 
I think the NFL draft evaluation has gotten a lot better to the point where we're kind of knowing like who the top guys are and they're, and they're going higher in the draft now than ever. Yeah. I mean, so you think the guy who drafted Spurgeon win or Giovanni Carmazzi, Carmazzi over Tom Brady, you know, yeah. may have had to answer some questions and it's fun. It's funny. Cause we actually, one of the other uh, great moments we've had recently and chaotically intolerant history was having Ryan Hogue, the 2003 Mr. Irrelevant on the program and just, and actually just hearing a lot about not just his story, which was great, obviously, but the actual, uh, you know, Process. greatness that, that yeah. goes with being Mr. Irrelevant. And, you know, in the sports books, they allow you to pick what the position of Mr. Relevant is going to be. But I think they should have like a lottery where you can actually submit names. And if you get the guy who's drafted, you know, 262 or whatever, be a That'd fun be cool. thing. And people, people would, it would give people a reason to start, you know, looking in more into these college football players yeah. that they wouldn't know otherwise. So, yeah, yeah it's great. I, I cool. said all of that idea is a great idea. Yeah. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Max. You want to plug anything? Yeah, uh, if you want to follow me on X and uh, TikTok, you can follow me at Max Chadwick CFB. Um, obviously, all my articles are at pff.com if you want to read them. And then uh, the show I host is called PFF College Football Show. You can find it on YouTube and anywhere you get your podcast, too. So, uh, yeah, it's basically where you can find me. Awesome. Um, any listeners, if you want to vote on the draft, go to chaoticallyintolerant.com right now. The vote will probably shut down on Monday morning or something like that. It usually just shuts down when pro probably when the next episode releases, so Monday morning. Um, but you can go vote on that there. Go like, subscribe, comment. Go check out Max's stuff. Go check out Draft America from Michael. And we will see you on Thursday. No, Monday.